good librarian, and uh, I first of all have to thank you for all coming out on a wet night. These days are challenges for us when Sarah and I both get up in the morning in our respective homes. We think the rain must stop so that everyone will show up. But we have a good crowd, and I really appreciate you coming out. This is our second month of events for this fall season, and if you are a guest with us tonight, please do pick up one of the events calendars. We have a few downstairs on the front desk, so feel free to take one. It just came out uh, in the last couple of days, and we have more programming through December. Before I introduce our speaker, Joshua Kendall, may I ask you to uh, take a moment, and if you have a cell phone or a pager, just take it out and silence it so it won't ring. Uh, during our event this evening, and we do record these events too, so it's wonderful when they can appear on the internet without telephones going off. This is the time of the year that we do ask our members to support our annual fund, and your contributions as members are really critical to supporting the library. They help us uh, plan Uh, Events like this evening's biography talk, uh, build our collection of over 300,000 books, uh, run a children's library, provide reader services, and everything we do here at the library. So thank you very much for your support. We do have copies of Mr. Kendall's book for sale tonight. Our friends from the Corner Bookstore up in Madison are here tonight, and they'll be happy to sell you a copy after uh, the event, and Mr. Kendall will also uh, be willing to uh, sign your book. When you think of the Society Library, founded in 1754, you would be correct to say, well, they've probably been collecting dictionaries for a long time. We've had them from the very beginning, and we actually still have a number of very interesting dictionaries from the 1700s and 1800s. I'm happy to let you know that we actually still own a copy of the two-volume Noah Webster American Dictionary of the American Language from the year 1828. I was able to wrestle it out of the hands of the Rare Book staff this evening, and we have it on display here. And after our event, do feel free to come up and look at it. I'll be happy to explain it to you. We also have another really interesting item, which is uh, an item published in 1789 in Boston, and it's Webster's Dissertations on the English Language. And it actually was a gift to the Society Library from the author, and uh, his penmanship is inside, so you can have a look at that. We have lots of great treasures in our special collections uh, like this. Our speaker tonight has been on a book tour uh, across the country, I believe that's correct, and he's had the pleasure of visiting many libraries like the Society Library. We have an association of membership libraries across the country, and Mr. Kendall has been at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia on this tour. He's been to St. Louis to visit the Mercantile Library. He's been in Salem at the Athenaeum, and he's been in Newport at the Redwood. And he is also a member of the Boston Athenaeum, our colleagues up in Boston, and he spoke there as well. So we are really happy to have him rounding out his uh, tour of the society uh, and membership libraries across the country. Our author was born in New York City. He calls Boston his home now. He received his bachelor's degree from Yale, where he studied comparative lit. He also did graduate work in comparative lit at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. And for his excellence in reporting on psychiatry, he has received National Journalism Awards from both the National Mental Health Association and the American Psychoanalytic Association. He is currently an Associates Fellow of Yale's Trumbull College. And Mr. Kendall is also the author of a biography of another fascinating lexicographer, the author of Roger's Thesaurus. So please welcome Joshua Kendall. Uh, Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to to be here. Uh, We all have used Webster's Dictionary, but few of us know much about its creator. And now I've been going to these membership libraries across the country, also in Charleston. And in each of, just about every stop, uh, there's a common uh, assumption, which is that Daniel wrote the dictionary and not Noah. At the Boston Athenaeum, my home base, uh, as soon as you walk in there, there's a big portrait of Daniel. 
and people say, hmm, that's the dictionary guy. And uh, Daniel was a, was a secretary of state and an eminent, uh, and a senator, but he was not a dictionary guy. Uh, and the point of my book is to say two things, that, uh, n- that it's Noah, not Daniel. And Noah wasn't just a word nerd, but he was actually a founding father. He was someone who gave us our cultural identity in ways uh, that go beyond uh, language. Now, when Noah Webster dies in 1843, he's very well known. One historian at the time says that he belongs in America's trinity of fame, along with Washington and Columbus. And that's not because of the dictionary, but it's because of another book that he wrote in 1783 that's not well known today, but it was the Harry Potter of its day. It's a spelling book that came out in 1783 and over the next century, it sold 100 million copies. So uh, it taught five generations of Americans how to read. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a re, it's basically a book that it, for school-aged kids teaching them language. And one of those school-aged kids uh, in 1858 was a senator from Mississippi by the name of Jefferson Davis. And here's what he says. We have a unity of language which no other people possess, and we owe this unity, above all, to Noah Webster's Yankee spelling book. So with his spelling book and with his dictionary, Noah Webster is going to give us American English. I'm going to talk more about that. I have a little note there about Confederate spellers, because those of you who know your history know that three years later, Jefferson Davis became the president of the Confederacy. Uh, at the Boston Athenaeum. And by the way, the Boston Athenaeum is actually a sister institution, and my Boston Athenaeum card allows me to take out books from here, and those of you who are members can also come to Boston. And I just want to let you know. Anyhow, one of the wonderful things that the Athenaeum has is that it has the world's largest con- collection of Confederate books and, and imprints. And during the Confederacy... Jefferson Davis, his day job was to kill us here in New New England in the north, but he still loved Webster's Speller. So during the Confederacy, they printed uh, copies of the Speller, which were, quote, changed for the present condition. So the Speller has sample sentences, and one of the sentences was, the president's term is four years. Well, Davis's term was six years. So in his version that comes out in Macon, Georgia, it's changed for the present condition. So, and and that really underlines the fact that Webster's achievement is that today, from Maine to California, we speak the same language, American English. If you go to old Europe, you go to France or Spain or Germany, every 20 kilometers, they speak a different dialect. We don't have dialects. Uh, and that's uh, thanks to Noah Webster. But the fascinating thing is that we could be killing each other at the same time as that we use the same language. And that's also true today, that we're a very divisive country, but we really, even though there are a few regional terms, that you, we can really st- understand each other much more easily. And, and that's remarkable because we're, we're so large. Now, Noah Webster, I talk his incredible shrinking reputation. He dies in 1843. Daniel Webster is very prominent in the 1840s, so Daniel becomes the more important Webster. Uh, And then the speller goes out of print by around 1900. Those last of the 100 million copies are sold. And Noah Webster also has another problem, that he's very crotchety. One historian has said he wanted to write a biography of Webster, but he hated him too much. (laughs) And, And another reason... He goes, his reputation declines, is this crotchety problem. And here's the way Ambrose Bierce put it in the 1911 Devil's Dictionary. Now, Bierce is a satirist who's going to take pot shots at everyone, but he can't help but take one of Webster. And he says, hell, he defines hell as the eternal resting place of the late Dr. Noah Webster, dictionary maker. So the point of my book is to bring him out of hell and to say, okay, he was crotchety, but still uh, he united us with his words and and, and even did other things, uh, which I'll get to.
All right, the key dates. Uh, Noah Webster, uh, early in his life, had what I call Forrest Gump moments associated with the Revolu American Revolution. He was a bit player. So he's born in West Hartford, and West Hartford is the only place that knows it's Noah, not Daniel. Uh, and I've spoken there, and his house is there, and if those of you who are Webster aficionados might want to visit his house. Uh, he goes to Yale, and in his summer vacation from Yale, before his senior year, he fights in the Battle of Saratoga. That's one of these Forrest Gump moments. He and his father and two brothers are bit players in the Battle of Saratoga. Those of you who know your American Revolution know that that's basically the only battle that we won, and that battle was pivotal in getting the French on our side. So Webster was always proud to have been there, kind of the creation of the American nation. Uh, another Forrest Gump moment is in 1775. George Washington comes to New Haven, and Webster greets him. Washington is en route to Cambridge, where he's going to take over command of the Continental Army. And Washington is soon to become an important figure in Webster's life. They're going to have a real relationship. But in the 1770s, Webster is just a bit player. He's the head of the Yale militia and plays his flute uh, when Washington uh, comes to town. All right, I told you about the speller. The official title is a Grammatical Institute of the English Language, uh, going back to John Calvin. Uh, and it really, it's a three-volume. It's a three-parter. The speller itself is the big seller, but it also has a grammar and a reader. Now, in 1785, now Webster, part of this crotchety is that he's very arrogant, and he always thinks he knows everything, and sometimes he's absolutely right. And in 1785, he has a national platform because the, seller, the speller is selling. And he says he knows what's wrong with America. And when he has an idea, he goes for it. And he writes a pamphlet called Sketches of American Policy. And he's very upset because America is then very divided. So what he's trying to do linguistically is unite us with a language, but he realizes that America is also very politically divided. And he writes this pamphlet and hands it to George Washington and goes to Mount Vernon and tell in this Yale whippersnapper, who's at about 26 years old, goes to tell George Washington, who's then the first farmer. Washington's in between the revolution and his presidency. And he goes to tell the first farmer what to do to fix America. And that's how my book starts, with Webster on his horse, going to tell Washington uh, how to solve America's problems. And I'll come back to that. Then, in 1787, I'm calling him a forgotten founding father because in 1787, Webster is at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he's a journalist, and in, in, right after the, uh, the convention, he writes a very influential pamphlet that's immediately circulated. He writes it in two days, and it's ready, and some historians have argued that his pamphlet was more influential than the Federalist Papers the Federalist Papers are more sophisticated, uh, but they come out later, and they're more important here in New York. But Webster's pamphlet was, was kind of quick and dirty. It was ready right away, and it circulated uh, for several months longer. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit later as well. Now, in, Webster also has this New York Association. Uh, in 1793, so Webster and Washington build a relationship with the sketches. In 1787, when Washington comes to the Constitutional Convention, the first thing he does is knock on, hotel, on Webster's hotel room door. Webster has a headache, but when George Washington knocks on your door, uh, you answer. Uh, in 1793, Washington is president, and he has a problem that the Jeffersonians are interested in another war with England. Washington wants to stay neutral, and he turns to his right-hand man, Noah Webster, Jr., and Noah Webster, Jr. becomes the editor of New York City's first daily newspaper. That, and he, so he, 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 he commutes by horse. He lives about a mile from Wall Street, uh, and that's called, he's a Federalist editor. That's called the American Minerva. It's a daily paper. Uh, Alexander Hamilton works on that paper. Uh, Hamilton and uh, the New York Post, which is the oldest continuously published daily newspaper, starts in 1801 because Webster and Hamilton have a fight. 
in 1800. That's the fight that splits the Federalist Party and allows Jefferson uh, to be elected. Uh, and, then, and then Hamilton uh, and Webster wants to go his own way uh, and starts the post. Webster's paper survives until about 1930 under various different incarnations. Now, Webster makes a lot of money. He's a very good businessman. I'll be coming back to that. Uh, his speller is selling. His newspaper is doing very well. So in 1798, he retires. And he's an obsessive, and I'll talk about that in a minute. He loves compiling and organizing words more than anything else in the world. Now, this is in direct, uh, uh, this, is, this is different from Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson wrote the first great dictionary, the English dictionary in 1755. Johnson said, no one but a blockhead ever wrote except for money. Webster is the exact opposite. He made his money, but he wants to write the dictionary. He can't wait to get started. He, and he moves back to New Haven, uh, where, he went to, uh, for, where he went for Yale, and he moves into the Arnold House. And yes, that's Benedict Arnold. Uh, Benedict Arnold, uh, he, and Webster gets a good deal because there's a lot of shame associated with the house, and the state took it over, so he gets it for around $2,300. But it's the fanciest house in town. Arnold was nouveau riche, and it's right by the water, and he wanted to show everyone in New Haven how much money he had. And Webster sets up shop in Arnold's house and decides to write the dictionary. That's in 1798, and the dictionary that you have there comes out in 1828. He's going to spend 30 years on it. But he's got to do two things. He's got to take on Samuel Johnson, but he's also got to take on Samuel Johnson Jr. And that's a funny story because there was an American, Samuel Johnson is, the, is a Brit, of course, but there was an American dictionary uh, that had come out uh, just that year, 1798, written by Samuel Johnson Jr. Now, if you had an agent and you were thinking of a name for a dictionary maker, that would be a good one. Call him Johnson Jr. It was no relation. It was a Connecticut school teacher, and he had written a 5,000-word, a small dictionary. So what Webster does is he first writes a compendious, and a compendious means brief. So what he first does is he tries to replace Johnson Jr. with a compendious dictionary in 1806, and I have a page from that in my slides at the end. And these small dictionaries look like a modern-day thesaurus. They have one-word definitions. And then he's going to spend the next 20 years uh, writing the big dictionary. All right. Uh, Noah Webster is the father of the modern publishing business. I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast about this. Uh, so he has the speller, and it's the first book published in the new United States of America we don't have a constitution, and the states have all the power. So what Webster does is he's afraid of piracy, so he personally goes around to every single state and gets copyright law passed. And as he does that, he has the first modern book tour, and he goes from Massachusetts to South Carolina, and I've tried to go to many of those same stops. I was also in another library I went to, it's in Charleston, uh, in the first modern book tour, and he, he's, he's, a, he's a mocker and a business maker, and he gets blurbs. He gets a blurb from Ben Franklin, blurbs the book you have there. And the book you have there, the dissertations, is based on lectures that he gave in the mid-1780s during his book tour when he was trying to sell uh, copies of The Speller. So blurbs. He tries to get a blurb from Washington, but Washington declines. He's shameless. He'll be, and for the dictionary, for the 1828 dictionary, I found a letter where he's asking John Marshall, the sitting Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, for a, for a blurb. Uh, but Wash Marshall also doesn't give him, give him one. Uh, also, uh, the publishing business, in 1788, he's here in New York for a year, uh, before he go, right after Philadelphia, the Constitutional Convention, and he starts something called the American Magazine, uh, which was one of our early literary magazines, maybe the Atlantic Monthly of its day. And, it was, and one of the wonderful things about the Athenaeum, I mean, George Washington may have checked out books from this library, but George Washington's books are in the Boston Athenaeum. They have uh, about a third of his library, 
So I, I got to look at his personal copies of Webster's books. So I got to look at George Washington's copy of this American magazine. And also, remember I told you that he goes to Mount Vernon and hands George Washington a copy of Sketches of American Policy. I also got to touch that. In case you're interested, Washington was not an underline. Uh, <laughs> so there's not a lot of action there. Uh, there's just a G. Washington. Now, Webster is also a savvy businessman. So he's an ardent Federalist, and he's an ally of Washington, but he's always looking at markets, and I'll come back to that. But when the, uh, in June 25th, 1788, New Hampshire becomes the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. So we now have uh, the Constitution. Webster is excited because he worked for it. He wrote the pamphlet, and he's, he was there at the convention. But he's also immediately thinking about the business angle. Remember, he went to all the states and got state copyright law passed. Well, under the Constitution, there's going to be national copyright law. So that very day, he writes to one of his publishers, this, meaning the Constitution, will allow me to enter into new contracts with regard to the speller. And he signs basically the first blockbuster deal uh, in American publishing uh, soon thereafter. All right, now we come to the tricky question of Webster's character. I talked about him being crotchety, and that's one of the reasons he fell out of favor. Uh, Joseph Ellis, the eminent biographer, says he's not the stuff of American mythology. He, was, he, was, he could be very nasty. Uh, he was a loner. One of his best friends for, uh, was a fellow named Joel Barlow, who he went to Yale with, who became an epic poet uh, in, the, in the late 18th century. He was friendly with Barlow for about 30 years, and one, and, and, uh, one day he just wrote Barlow, say, I want, I want nothing more to, to do with you, because Webster became religious, and Barlow wasn't. He said, you're an atheist. I want nothing more to do with you. Two years later, he writes him a letter and asks him for a favor, pretending as, as if nothing ever happened. So that's the kind of guy. So Jill Lepore, looking at that kind of behavior, goes a bit further and says, well, he's no Joseph Stalin. But just the fact that you have to say that, she says basically he wasn't an evil man, he was an unlikable man. And I think what, what makes biography exciting is that people are complex, and I think biographers tend to either idealize or demonize figures. And I think what I'm trying to do in this book is say that, okay, he was crotchety, but he also, but he also had these great achievements, and maybe even there's a relationship between the personality disorder and the achievement. And I argue that he had what psychiatrists call obsessive compulsive personality disorder. He loved order, rules, and lists. Now, that's not the same as OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. People with OCD have trouble leaving the house. Uh, they, they're afraid that the house is going to burn down, and they're really anxious, and they'll check the, they'll check the, the stove a thousand times, and they're never sure. They're not going to write a dictionary. But these high, but obsessive compulsive personality disorder, those people have tremendous amounts of energy. And I did a piece for Psychology Today, and people with OCD often seek treatment because they have difficulty functioning. They'll, they'll try medication or therapy. But as I argue in that piece, people with OCPD, with the personality disorder, they tend to drive other family members into treatment, <laughs> uh, like their wives or their children. Uh, and Webster had a son who had lifelong depression, and I had a sense it wasn't being easy being his only son. He and Rebecca Greenleaf, I, ha I had a, uh, something about her up there. He meets, her, he meets his wife at the Constitutional Convention, and I call that courtship at the Constitutional Convention. And Rebecca Greenleaf is very wealthy. She comes from a, a, a Boston family of 15 children. So Webster, uh, in part, followed the... The, he, he and the, the person I wrote about in my last book, Peter Mark Roger of the Thesaurus, both made one, uh, had a lot in common. And one of the things they had in common is they both married rich, and, and that helped them uh, with their literary careers. And I want to say about Webster is that he's a compiling and organizing machine. So it's not only words, but remember on that book tour, he, during his off days on the book tour, he would do a personal house count 
of the number of houses in every major American city. And I have that list that I fished out the New York Public Library. So New York had about 3,300 houses. New York City then was just the Wall Street area, so you could walk around in a, in a few hours. And, and that data set was later fo- folded into the first census. But he just loves organizing and compiling. And one of the things I've said in some interviews is that for most of us, the task of writing a dictionary from scratch or of or the source of scratch would drive us crazy. But for my guys, it may well prevent them from going crazy. It organizes them and grounds them. Uh, he also was a public health expert. Uh, here in New York in the 1790s, there was the yellow fever that was killing people left and right. And Webster was the editor of New York City's first daily newspaper. He immediately uh, sent out a survey in the newspaper that, and, and that's basically the, the, the foundation of public health research. So in the Arnold House, his first book is a brief ep- history of epidemic and pestilential diseases. Now, brief for Webster is 700 pages, but it's this major public health treatise that William Os- Osler has said was the most significant uh, work by a, a non-medical person you know, on a medical topic in the 19th century. He also, and this is something he shared with Thomas Jefferson, he loves to crunch temperature uh, data. The thermometer was a new toy, kind of like your iPhone today in the 18th century, so a lot of obsessives would crunch the numbers, and Webster and Jefferson both crunch temperature data, and they actually have... The, uh, I wrote a piece for the Smithsonian about how, how Web, it wasn't Al Gore and George Bush, but it was Webster and Jefferson who had America's first great global warming debate. And then he also writes on the side a four-volume encyclopedia uh, in the Arnold House. Uh, so he's compiling and organizing. And, and I think that this focus really... My obsessives tend to live very long. He lived till 85. Peter Marc Roger lived until 90. But, but again, their family members, uh, some of them didn't, do, didn't thrive uh, quite as well. All right, Webster and the Constitution. So I told you uh, that he... he, he he writes this pamphlet that he gives to Washington. Now, Webster lived in Connecticut, and what he wants to do is bring the reasonableness of Connecticut uh, to, to the nation. And, he, and in this, in this uh, pamphlet that he passes on to Washington, he's going to make the case that we need to replace the Articles of Confederation with a more, with a more uh, centralized government and that we're going to need a new founding document. And he looks at Connecticut as his model, and he says, and he was friendly with Connecticut's governor, and he says, in Connecticut, thus the whole power of the state is brought to a single point, united in a single person. And that is basically a draft of the idea of the president, that, because under the Articles of Confederation, there was no locus of, of power. It was all diffuse. Uh, and and, and uh, all right, and then in the, there's one other point. Uh, yeah, so Washington gets, gets the pamphlet, and I describe this in the opening scene, and Washington always knew what to do. Remember, he's not an underliner, and Washington wasn't a, a policy guy. So I, I start the book with a dinner conversation between Webster and Washington. He, Webster makes these points that we need something like a constitution, and Washington is very nervous at this dinner because Washington wasn't a college guy, wasn't an underliner, and, but he was surrounded by all these brilliant people like James Madison from Princeton, John Adams from Harvard, Webster, a Yale guy. So at the end of the dinner in 1785 in May, he says, thank you very much, Mr. Webster. I'm going to pass on your pamphlet to James Madison as soon as possible, and he'll read it. So Washington was an expert delegator, and Madison looked at Webster's pamphlet and had it you know, at, at his side as he was thinking about the Constitution. And this is the official title of that 1787 pamphlet that Webster writes in the fall that I talked about earlier. Now, remember, in 1787, he's a future lexicographer. He wants to be a word guy, but he can't afford it. But he makes a brilliant argument in favor of the Constitution in this pamphlet. He makes a lexicographical argument. And he basically says, the Constitution, we should, you should all, the state should try to ratify the Constitution because the definitions are good. And if you think about it, 
it makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's why that's been such a, uh, a flexible and resilient document, and everyone is in love with it. And here's what he says, an example. The bounds of jurisdiction between the federal and state governments are marked with precision. And he's a guy who knew that kind of thing. He, precision uh, was his uh, livelihood. All right, now a little bit about the dictionary. So he writes the Compendious Dictionary. Uh, that uh, comes out in 1806. And for, for, my, for all my books, what I really love to do is archival research. And Webster, Webster's Dictionary, the 1828, the original manuscript is not in one place. You can't just go to Yale or to the Morgan, uh, but all of these places have pieces of it. Uh, the family sold off pages in the late 19th century to make money so they can get, I don't know, $10 a page, or, 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 and they kind of partialized it. So I went around to all the usual places, and like the Morgan here in New York, uh, New York Public, and, and Yale, Beinecke, and Sterling. But at a small museum in New Haven, I actually saw the first page, and I'll show that to you at the end of the talk. And it's as if he went to Staples and gets a little pamphlet and dates it and says, November 3rd, 1807. And surprise, surprise, a dictionary starts with A. Uh, and, and I'll show you that first page. And that page is the end paper of my book. So the first draft of you know, the, the handwritten page for that book that you have there uh, is in, in a small museum in New Haven and the last biographers. Uh, and it's not like Lincoln, they're not 10,000 because of the crotchety, and also the, you know, he, he wasn't a Civil War president, but uh, considering his importance, there, aren't, there haven't been that many biographers, but uh, I was the first person to find that in the New Haven Museum. And then he does A and B. And I talked about the religious conversion. He becomes a born-again Christian in 1808, and then he's got an idea. Remember I said he's very arrogant, and he thinks he knows everything. In, in most cases, that serves him well. But here he's very arrogant and he makes a big mistake. Based on his religious beliefs, he is convinced that all languages go back to the language of his biblical namesake, Noah, on the ark. And he decides to spend 10 years writing an etymology. It's a 1,000 pages, and today it's gathering dust at the New York Public Library. Uh, I spent a couple of days looking at it. There's a scholar who's written an article about it that I cite, but it's basically complete gibberish. So in most cases, his madness is helping him. His obsessionality is helping him write the dictionary. But here's one case, and I call this chapter a lost decade. And, and the, the Germans were actually coming up with solid etymology, but he ignores them. He's very arrogant. In fact, on that 1828 dictionary, he has one assistant, a guy named James Gates Percival, who was another kind of crazy dictionary maker, and that's a whole other story. He was a Yale eccentric. But Percival knows his etymology, and he's so horrified by what Webster is doing that he writes to a friend in Latin. He can't control himself. Multa absurda removi. Many absurd things I have removed. So Webster writes a thousand-page etymology, and then and that's never published, but he tries to stick in some of his funny etymological ideas in the definitions. Percival tries to take them out, and Percival gets fired. So that's the loner for you. He fires his one helper. Now, James Murray, the editor of the Oxford English Dictionary, has tremendous respect for Webster. He calls Webster a great definer, but he's also sober and, when it comes to etymology, reality-based. And he says... Critiquing Webster's etymology, he says, etymology is word history, and word history is a record of facts. Webster isn't interested in facts. In those 1,000 pages, he has one speculative hypothesis, which he backs with another one, and he's always right, and there's no uh, empirical testing. Uh, in, in the, and I love reading his letters, so in 1817, I'll read his letters, and I'll, and I'll say, well, now I'm up to, back to C. So that's how I get uh, these comments. In 1821, he's up to H. Now, a little bit about his method. The New York Public Library has the 1799 copy, Webster's personal copy of Johnson's Dictionary. Uh, and that has annotations. So Johnson's Dictionary comes out in 1755. Johnson dies in about 1784. But it's constantly being expanded. And what was thrilling 
was to see what Johnson's 1799 is about 58,000 words. Webster's Dictionary is going to be about 70,000 words. And what he's going to add is he's going to add a lot of terms from science and technology. Uh, but there are these little black marks on Johnson's Dictionary. And Webster absolutely hated Shakespeare. Remember, Johnson and Webster have different sensibilities. Johnson has the soul of a poet, and he's always quoting Shakespeare uh, for his definition. Webster wants to cite of a lot of American authors, because it's an American dictionary, but he absolutely hates Shakespeare. And this goes back to his Yale days, because in the 1780s, uh, drama was considered uh, two steps away from sex. Yale students... Uh, would be penalized for attending a play or penalized twice as much for performing in a play. And what Webster does is he has these little black marks. I mean, I'm not going to cite Shakespeare here. But what he does in that 1828 dictionary is he blames Johnson for the dirt, he blames Shakespeare for the dirty words in the English language. So if you look up in that book under whore son, son of a whore, he's just going to write shack, S-H-A-K, He's not going to quote Shakespeare, but it's just like, okay, that's Shakespeare. Dirty word that you can blame Shakespeare. So, yeah, that's part of his religious conversion. And that 1828 uh, dictionary is also going to have his religious ideas. He's going to define marriage as a covenant between man, woman, and God. So, and I'll talk a little bit about how the dictionary has evolved. All right. And so his method, he's, he's leaning on Johnson, and he's also leaning on Ro- Robert Ainsworth, who wrote a Latin-English dictionary, and and the Morgan Library has Webster's annotated pages of Ainsworth's dictionary, and I uh, show one of those pages in the biography. And he also has a lot of scientific encyclopedias, and he's going to be adding all these scientific terms, and and that's also going to define America as a country, that we're a very, you know, we're, we're you know, we're that, today we're the head of technology, that's really what America has been about. And the dictionary is going to really be in a statement, not only about the American language, but about American culture and interests. And these decisions that Webster are, makes are going to have far-reaching consequences. All right. Now, Webster wants, the dic- wants to write the dictionary because he can't, he can't stop. But no one else is interested in the dictionary. Americans love Johnson. I did a piece for The Globe uh, that Americans have always loved Johnson, but Johnson actually hated Americans. He said, I'm willing to love all mankind except an American. He thought we were a bunch of hypocrites. You know, They whelp about freedom over there in America, but then they have slavery. You know, it's a pretty good telling critique there. But we love Johnson, and everyone said, Noah, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're messing with the established order. Don't do it. But he keeps doing it. And then he has an idea. He goes on a research trip to Europe in 1824. Remember, he's a canny businessman, and he's always looking for new markets. And one of the things about Webster and other obsessives is they're full of contradictions. So remember, in the 1780s, it's all about American nationalism. In the 1820s, the problem is how how to market his dictionary. And he completely changes his tune. And he says, hmm, maybe I can come up with a new language a new dictionary called the Universal Dictionary of the English Language and market it on both sides of the Atlantic and have a wider market. So while he's in England, he wants to set up a conference between Oxford, Cambridge, and him to decide what universal, uh, you know, what this universal English would be. But Oxford and Cambridge can see through it, and they're not buying. And if they had, today we might all be spelling color the same way uh, but but he, but he, it, they didn't, and he goes back, and eventually in 1827 he finds a New Haven publisher uh, and publishes that book. Now, that book only sold about 2,500 copies. It wasn't a big seller, but what was a big seller was the abridged edition, and that's true today, uh, at least until the iPhone. You know, the, the, the Collegiate Dictionary has sold 56 million copies, the, the Merriam-Webster, but the big fat one doesn't sell as many copies. But Webster can't stop. Remember, he loves the dictionary, and, and he doesn't, you know, he could have lived off the, the abridged dictionaries, but he wants to keep going. And at the age of 80, he mortgages his, he, he moves from the Arnold House to another house in New Haven. 
he mortgages his second house in New Haven to write the second edition of the dictionary. His family is horrified, and he's still going at it when he dies at at, uh, 84 in 1843. And Harvard's Houghton Library has an 1844 edition of Webster's published in Amherst that's Emily Dickinson's personal copy. And just as Virginia Woolf couldn't have a, have a room of her own, Emily Dickinson couldn't have a dictionary of her own, the only words in it are her father's. And that was the, her father's name. And that was the dictionary she used. She once describes it as her sole companion. Uh, and that says as much about the importance of Webster's as about her eccentricity. She was a loner. But she uses that dictionary uh, to write her poetry. And I blogged about this because the, the, the fly leaf of the dictionary is all worn down. There was a green marble foredge, and all the green is gone because she kind of lived in that dictionary as she uh, wrote her poetry. But so in 1841 is the last major revision, and then there's this minor revision that comes out in 1844. And today we talk about new words like the blogosphere or whatever the word, uh, or, or, or LOL or something. But Webster in 1844, here are the new words that he was sticking in. So he, he died, but on his deathbed he had these new words which were then uh, folded into the 1844 dictionary. And some of those new words were aerodynamics, agronomy, and puritanically. Now a little bit about uh, the dictionary since Webster. Merriam-Webster comes in around 1847. They buy it from the family. And remember there all, there's all that bogus etymology And I did a piece for The Nation about the 1864 edition of Webster's. So that's going to be the first modern, great modern English dictionary. It's not going to have any of the religious stuff. It's not going to have the bogus etymology. And the way it came about is the publisher, and I read this at correspondence at Yale, that the publisher uh, realized, because the Brothers Grimm had come out with, with the German dictionary, and realized that the etymology was all wrong, and if he didn't fix it, uh, so he, he doesn't have the, the thousand pages, but there's still those ideas that he's inserting constantly. So they hired a German to do the etymology, and they published this 1864 edition of Webster's. Now, that 1864 edition, I argue in this nation piece, is really the, the template for the OED. Uh, the OED is based on Webster's 1864 James Murray, when he proposes the OED, says it's going to be about seven times as big, and it's, off, and it's actually about ten times as big. But what I'm arguing is that that's really a great dictionary, and the OED is much bigger. The OED finally comes out in 1928, the last volume, but it's not all that much better. The first modern dictionary that you could use with solid etymology, with a lot of illustrative quotations, uh, is really that Webster's 1864, And after my nation story came out, a fellow uh, who's writing a new history of the OED from Oxford Press wrote me an email, and I started corresponding to him and with him. And I asked him, "Whatever happened to James Murray's copy? Because James Murray's copy of the 1864 was kind of like Webster's copy of the 1799 of Johnson." And he said that Murray used it so much that it was pulverized. And, And I want to make the point that. Webster was crotchety, and maybe as a result that American lexicographers really haven't gotten, uh, uh, have gotten short shrift. And we really need to see that the world capital of English lexicography from 1798 to 1864 was New Haven. And I make a joke, for those of you who know about literary criticism, that you know, a century before we had Yale's hermeneutic mafia, we had their lexicographical mafia in the 1860s. That, the, that that 1864 was half of the Yale faculty got together and wrote that dictionary. And one of the contributors was W.C. Minor. Those of you who are hardcore word nerds will no, re, remember that name. W.C. Minor is the madman in Simon Winchester's bestseller, The Professor and the Madman. And that's about the correspondence between James Murray, who I've talked about, the editor of the OED, and his right-hand man, who wrote thousands of illustrative quotations from his cell in an insane asylum. He was a Yale student 
who went mad and was locked up in a British insane asylum. Well, Winchester, as a Brit who thinks that Americans don't know much about lexicography, never looked at the 1864 because Miner's name is in it. And I went back into the files and I found Miner's contract that, that the future star of the OED actually worked on Webster's 1864. But there's, there's even more than that, is that it, the 1864 was revered. Uh, every publication uh, wrote glowing reviews. No one had ever seen anything like it. Uh, but the one weak link was W.C. Minor. And people came after him and saying his definitions were lousy. And they were. He wasn't a good definer for the uh, for the OED, what he does is he compiles illustrative quotations. He doesn't actually do definitions. Uh, so the fellow from England, when I, when I relayed this information to him, he said, well, that James Murray, he always knew what to do. He gave Minor the right assignment. He didn't trust him with definitions. But the point that I want to make is that the future star of the OED couldn't cut it as an American lexicographer. And I think that we need to be proud of Noah Webster, crotchety or not, and our American lexicographers. All right, thanks very much.